And this morning, uh, I am really excited about this morning because, uh, for one thing, I have been to Israel, Palestine, and I've seen the water situation. And it's not a pretty thing. And uh, I just merely saw it. So this morning, I'm glad that we have an expert here that can explain everything that I looked at but probably didn't see or understand. And our uh, speaker this morning, Dr. Uh, David Van Wylen, is uh, from St. Olaf College here in Northfield, Minnesota. Okay, so let's start with this uh, thought about water uh, being uh, precious. And when you see um, down at the bottom of the screen where it says a photo, this is by a, a student. When I take students um, abroad, I always have them do a, some kind of a photo project. And this time in 2008 when we were in the Middle East, I had them take photos of how they saw water uh, in the Middle East. And so you'll see many photos taken <laughs> Uh, by students. So water uh, clearly is precious in many ways. In its most basic form, all of biological uh, life takes place in water. This is not news to any of you. Water is essential for our existence. We know about the problems of dehydration and the need uh, physically to uh, have water uh, in our life. But beyond that, life is, or water is uh, precious in many other ways. Think of the way community life revolves uh, around water. Uh, we build cities on rivers and lakes and oceans. And uh, most cities, somewhere along the way, find ways to make water features, usually in our community gathering spaces. So water is precious for uh, community life. Recreational life thrives on water, if you just think about the many ways in which water is part of our uh, leisure time, our recreational time here in Minnesota, a lot of it is spent with water in its solid form. Uh, but still, we find ways to make water part of our recreational life. Commercial life depends on water. This is a tannery in, uh, in Morocco. But so much of commercial life, from the way we make uh, computer chips to Closed to so many different things, commercial life uh, depends heavily on, on water. Spiritual life incorporates water. Many of the great religions of the world, uh, like this pure, uh, this cleansing outside of a mosque in, uh, in Istanbul, uh, spiritual life incorporates water. Water is often used as a spiritual uh, metaphor. These words from the Gospel of John, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He's speaking to a woman standing at a well where she comes to draw water, and he's using water as a spiritual metaphor. Now, it's interesting. Does anyone know what her response to this is? She's still thinking literally. Yeah. She still says, uh, sir, give me this water that I won't get thirsty. I have to keep coming. So she hears the spiritual, but she's still thinking literal. Now, fresh water is uh, especially uh, precious. If we take a look at this graph, this is... Uh, represents all the water on the, uh, the Earth's surface. We are a watery planet. This is 100 drops here. And uh, of these 100 drops, 97 of these are represented as salt water. 97% of, uh, of the available water on the surface is salt water, actually a little more than 97%. And salt water in its salty state is not useful to us as a way to maintain the biological importance of water. So we really end up talking about this 3% of fresh water. Now of this 3% of fresh water, the majority of that is actually stored in ice caps and other frozen areas. So really the readily available water that we need to work with relative to meeting uh, our needs is a small amount of all the water presence, present on the uh, Earth's surface. 
So this makes a little sense now, this famous phrase from the rhyme of the ancient uh, mariner, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. So water uh, clearly is precious, essential to uh, our life. We know these words, right? They're so basic, water so basic, so primal, that in many cases it seems like we just take it for granted. So this comes from the very first phrase of the Hebrew Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we have this sense that God created in this story something out of nothing. Okay, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. So there was nothing, right? Well, not really. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, I'm no theologian, but it's almost as if this story is, says, okay, in the beginning there was God and water. And then everything else came from God and water. Okay, let's look at the global uh, water context. I don't have uh, a lot of numbers to share relative to this, but a few basics. Our world population of about uh, 7 billion people. Currently, uh, when people try to estimate how many people don't have access to clean drinking water, they uh, cite the number of around 780 million people. So maybe about one in eight people don't have access to clean uh, drinking water. And in this definition of what does access mean, anyone know what access means? How close? Availability. Well, access meaning availability, but how close do you have to be to water to say you have access to water? This close. Well, the official definition is about a kilometer, about a 10 to 15 minute walk. Now, if you think about our lives, what's the furthest we are away from fresh, clean, accessible, safe, very, very, very cheap drinking water during our day? Usually it's a matter of feet, really. I mean, think where you have right now. There's this jug of water in the back of this room, and there's drinking fountains in the, fountain, in the building, and so really what they're talking about is people that don't have, actually have to walk a significant different, uh, distance. And we could talk a lot more about this, but who tends to walk to get the water when you don't have ready access to it? Women. Women, yeah. Women versus men. How about boys versus girls? Girl. Girls, okay. Uh, and this is not easy. This is carrying usually five-gallon buckets that weigh 40, 50 pounds, many uh, you know, for quite a distance. Uh, oftentimes cited along with uh, access to drinking water in the water field is uh, basic sanitation. Here the numbers are even more dire. Uh, 2.5 billion people lack basic sanitation, and this is an underlying cause for many, many diseases um, based on, uh, on this lack of sanitation. So we will look a lot at maps today. So these are the kind of maps that you see relative to water issue. These, this is a map of the world looking at uh, water stress in major basins. So this really is looking at not where do people lack access to water, but where are we stressing the current water uh, basins. You can see in our country we are really stressing the water basins in our southwest. And if you've ever been to Arizona, Nevada, Southern California, seen the Colorado River, which no longer even runs to the sea because of all its diversions and use. Um, you know, a little bit for us here, we are stressed in the southeast, but you can see parts of the world where there's a lot of stress on existing water basins, ranging from the darker color where really these basins are uh, really overexploited to heavily exploited, moderately exploited. So there's a lot of areas of the world where we are uh, overexploiting our water basins. And this is another kind of map which has a little different view 
The previous one looked at where are we exploiting our water basins. This one looks really at where, at where do we find the world for whatever reason uh, water scarcity. For example, one of the most water scarce areas in the world relative to people having access to usable water is in sub-Saharan Africa. That's not because they are exploiting their water basins. It's because in this case they are a situation of economic water scarcity. They don't have the means and the infrastructure to get water that they do have to the people that live there. So people that live there uh, exist in a state of pretty significant water uh, scarcity. And so you can see economic water scarcity, you can see areas of physical water scarcity, which will uh, overlay somewhat with what we saw in the previous slide. And you can see this area of the United States as well. Areas where there's really no water scarcity, you know, where there's plenty of rainfall and sometimes, oftentimes, not much population. Um, and then lots of areas that are uh, approaching. So, you know, people that, that know this field say that, you know, you look forward to 2025 and beyond, and this is just getting worse. It's getting worse because of a whole host of reasons. Climate change is making this situation worse. It's making dry areas uh, more dry. Population growth stresses available water. Economic growth, lots of people, for very good reasons, want to see development happen uh, to bring people out of poverty, but as you do that, you create businesses that need water, individuals move more into the middle class and tend to have more water demands. So economic growth uh, puts stress on water. As we pollute water, we have less available water that's in a usable form. We are really diverting rivers and draining our aquifers at an alarming rate. The rivers, at least when they're diverted, we can see what's happening. We can see that the Colorado River no longer runs to the sea. It's so heavily diverted. But we cannot see what we're doing to the aquifers underground. And there are some really serious situations of draining the aquifers so that wells, for example, that were put in 10 years ago at a certain depth no longer hit water because we have drained the groundwater. Uh, and the aquifer level has dropped. So this situation uh, is, is, uh, is only getting worse. On top of this, uh, one of the big challenges relative to water is that the, the major river basins don't respect country boundaries. So this map, which shows some of the major river basins uh, in the world, just is meant to give you this visual image of some of the challenges. So for example, the Nile River. Look at that. 11 different countries share the rivers of the Nile, or show the waters of uh, the Nile, including Egypt at the end of that river. That river is flowing in this direction. Egypt at the end of it, the most powerful country, which is very worried about what's happening upstream country like Ethiopia would love to use more of that water as they develop. Egypt doesn't want. There's only a finite amount of water in the Nile River Basin. And you can see why we may well live in one of the places in the world where you really can be most water ignorant. I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way, but we don't really have to think very much living here in Minnesota about a global water situation. Most of our river basin it sits within our own country. And here we are at the beginning of the river, so we don't have to worry at all, okay? Because we could pull as much as we want out of the Mississippi River, and so much so that none of it goes down to New Orleans, and good for us, okay? So we are really in an area, and we have rainfall sufficient in general, so, uh, but there's a lot of challenges associated with countries figuring out how to share, uh, share water in various rivers. And we'll see this in more detail when we think about the river in uh, Israel, in Palestine, the Jordan River. Okay, so we'll close out this section with this quote from the former UN Secretary uh, General uh, in 2003, 
who said water will be more important than oil in this century. And we'll see how that plays out. Okay, now let's shift our attention to the topic of the day, looking at water issues in uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, so, you know, we'll focus, here's Israel, here's the West Bank and Egypt. I, think these, I love these kinds of photos too. To give you an illustration, a nighttime satellite view of this part uh, of the world. So we'll focus our attention here on, uh, on this part of the Jordan River Basin. Okay, so I want us to spend a little time looking at maps to get some important geography in mind relative to water uh, issues. So here is uh, a good portion of uh, Israel, the Sea of uh, Kinneret or Sea of Galilee. Here's the Jordan River, the Jordan Valley surrounding it, uh, and the Dead Sea. So what I want to point out here in these two maps is this central mountain area where most of the rainfall is in Israel. Um, and then surrounding that, the coastal plain and the Jordan River Valley. This is an elevation map of Israel that shows you that this is the high part of Israel and then you come down towards sea level. And I have to make a confession uh, now and tell you that I'm red green colorblind and I don't know if anyone else in the room is red green colorblind but I'm with you okay so if I point to something and say you know in this green area and it's really red just sort of nod along and and humor me but it, you know sometimes we do struggle with maps like this so you're not alone okay so anyway you know you can see the coming down towards sea level here and then this well-known area around the Dead Sea that's actually uh, below uh, sea level. So the importance of the mountains, I want you to remember this mountain region because we'll talk about a major aquifer underneath that area called the mountain uh, aquifer and there is a coastal aquifer and we'll talk a lot about the Jordan Valley and the Jordan River Basin. Uh, this is the rainfall map for uh, this region. And so, you know, this is the area of the highest rainfall. And this is a pretty good amount of rainfall that falls uh, in here. And then you can see it's quite dry uh, along the Jordan River. And then southern Israel is quite, uh, quite desert-like. So we really are talking. And all of these maps, or nearly all of them, you can see the outline here of the West Bank area. Okay, so you can see where the rain is falling, plenty of water seeming to fall right there, right? So you think, oh, there should not be a problem for people living here because there's pretty good rainfall. But as we're going to see, that is not the case. But Gaza is very dry. Gaza is quite dry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Gaza down here is, is outside of this area, and Gaza has... Well, we'll talk about Gaza. Gaza has sort of a double challenge of being dry to begin with and then being left with a very dire situation for, for getting their water. Okay, so I want to spend some time talking about uh, the Jordan uh, River Basin. So just you know, by way of you know, orientation, we'll spend some time talking about uh, this map. The Jordan, here's the you know, Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias, various names. And this outline here of, you know, this is all the Jordan River uh, Basin. Um, this map also shows where there is an aquifer. There's an aquifer underneath the mountainous area here. And this whole thing, I'll talk about in a little more detail, the mountain aquifer. You can see these arrows are showing the drainage areas off of the mountain. So there's a lot of drainage going uh, this way to the west, and a little bit of drainage going to the river, but we really want to focus on the uh, Jordan River Basin. Okay, so 1967, Israel takes the Golden Heights and the West Bank in the, uh, the Six-Day War. Now, there's a lot of tension placed on the grabbing of the West Bank, but 
Why was the Golan Heights so strategic? Why did Israel so badly want to gain control of the Golan Heights up in here? All right. Well, let's take a look at that area. So here's Sea of Galilee, Israel, Syria, and here's the Golan Heights area. So let me look at this map in the corresponding area that shows all the drainage into the Sea of Galilee. So if you control this area, what do you control? You control the water. So many people think that Israel's real desire to control the Golan Heights, because it's not, have you been to the Golan Heights? I mean, I've seen it from a distance. I've not been there, but, you know, it's sort of an upper, you know, plateau area that's not lush. And, but if you control all these, the area where all the water is draining in the Sea of Galilee, you can control, essentially, the water of what begins the Jordan River Basin coming out of the, the lower Jordan, out of the Sea of Galilee. So by taking the Golan Heights and the West Bank, Israel now controls 100% of the Jordan River waters. They control what flows in to the Sea of Galilee, and now they control the Jordan River. And as they do that, and uh, over time, they start to destroy pumping stations and take over the water on both sides of the uh, Jordan River. They put dams in and they heavily, heavily divert the flow. I'll show you more about the diver some of the main diversions uh, going on. So they reduce the natural flow through the Jordan River to about 10% of what its natural flow uh, should be. So that if you've seen the Jordan River now, it's almost sort of a heavily polluted uh, drainage ditch. This is a picture that my son took of the Jordan River. That's the mighty Jordan right there. So I want you to take a look at this as you read this story from the Old Testament and try to imagine sort of a discrepancy between what you see and the words. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest care and the Ark of the Covenant went ahead. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam while the water flowing down to the Dead Sea was completely shut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho, the priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed crossing on dry ground. This Jordan, you could like take some two by 12s, throw them across, and cross the Jordan. Jordan River is way different now than what it was. As a result of the diverting water out of the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River, the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has lost a lot of its volume uh, as well. Dead Sea continues to decline somewhere around a meter per year. It drops. It's lost a third of its natural surface area. You can see this series of photos from 1972 to 1989 to 2011, where there are now areas that are completely uh, dry now. Um, and this has been such a concern that some people have proposed that one of the ways to refill the Dead Sea is to create a conduit from the Red Sea, which is sort of a crazy, crazy plan. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but it's been proposed as this red dead conduit as a way to deal with this problem. Okay. Now I want to point out another thing about um, Israel and what they've done uh, with water. And, and one of the points I'll make later is uh, it's, it's easy to be critical of the Israelis and the way they manage water relative to the Palestinians, but they're pretty innovative 
and they're pretty good engineers, and they come up with some pretty interesting projects from an engineering perspective. Uh, which one? Not necessarily social justice perspective, and I'll tell you about one right now. And this is called the Israel National Water Carrier. So if you take a look out of uh, the Sea of Galilee and see this long line here, divides here, comes down, this is called the National, Israel National Water Carrier. It's about 100 miles of pipes and canals and tunnels. It takes water out of the Sea of Galilee and delivers it to western and southern Israel. So a lot of the flow that water that would naturally come down the Jordan River and you would think be available for those living along the Jordan River doesn't even have a chance to get there because Israel has diverted. Uh, so much of it. I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about this uh, national water carrier later. So that gives you a little sense of the Jordan River uh, Basin and some basic aspects of, uh, of this. Okay, now I want to introduce and speak a little bit about uh, the 1995 Oslo II uh, Interim Accord. So this was a historic moment uh, with Rabin, Clinton, and Arafat um, of coming up with uh, many different agreements, one of which was uh, this Article 40, where these words were put into the agreement. Israel recognizes the Palestinian water rights in the West Bank. That's a good start. Uh, these will be negotiated in the permanent status negotiations and settled in the permanent status agreement relating to various water resources. So this was intended to be an interim five-year agreement that had sort of a basis in starting to think about how are we going to share water, okay? Uh, th there was never, never uh, a permanent status agreement that was negotiated. So one of the problems is that Israel and Palestine still abide by what was intended to be an interim five-year agreement, the Oslo II. And as we'll see as we work through it, um, there was a lot of things that just weren't very fair about this agreement. But that's the, one of the real underlying problems is that they never really did what they intended to do, and that was come up with a permanent solution. Okay, so let's look a little bit about at this uh, Oslo II uh, agreement. <clears throat> okay, so this is where I want to come back and focus uh, on this area right here. And you can see it says here the mountain aquifer. This dashed line is... Uh, so sort of the, the peak of this mountain range, and then underneath it, well, this is, remember this is where most of the rain falls. Rain falls in the ground and fills this, sinks down and fills this mountain aquifer. And you can see the flow lines away from uh, that aquifer. Now, remember that Israel already has 100% control over uh, the Jordan River. Palestinians don't have ability to utilize or control the waters of uh, the Jordan River. And currently that's about six to 700 million cubic meters per year. It's just the units in question, yeah. Um, looking at the map, uh, the country of Jordan uh, borders the, uh, the eastern side of the Jordan River, yeah? That's correct. So, so the, the, the ne negotiations to Israel and Jordan are also uh, active and alive. Jordan does have some access to the Jordan River water. So we're really talking just about Jordan River water that is available in the West Bank. Israel controls it all. Has Jordan diverted any of that water? Jordan would like to divert. They would like to put dams on rivers that feed into it. And so water, yeah, it's, it's contentious there too. 
All right, the coastal aquifer is the other major aquifer. Um, and this aquifer uh, forms and then tends to flow underground. The water tends to flow down this way towards Gaza. So there again, uh, the upstream area of the coastal aquifer is completely controlled by Israel. And one of the real problems for the Palestinians living in Gaza is that um, Gaza's water can only come from the portion of the aquifer underneath Gaza. And that aquifer has now become quite heavily polluted. Um, and so Gazans are, are really quite stressed relative to water, in part because, you know, Tel Aviv and other major coastal cities, they can take pretty much what they want out of that coastal aquifer. So we're going to focus a lot on this mountain aquifer, which has a recharge rate. You know, these are just, you know, again, some relative numbers. They say a recharge rate of about 679 million cubic meters per year. So that means that the rainfall that falls on that, there is, you know, you are recharging the aquifer. That's good because if you're going to pull water out of that aquifer, you want to make sure that there is some uh, recharge of that aquifer. Important point, the Oslo II Accord applies only to the portion of the mountain aquifer underneath the West Bank. So you can see the aquifer it goes beyond the West Bank. It only pertains to the area in the West Bank. Okay, this is another map to give you a little bit of that uh, idea. So this whole, I'm sorry, this outer line here, that's the aquifer boundary. Okay, so out here you get into the coastal aquifer. So you can see, here's the dashed line of the West Bank boundary. So you can see the aquifer goes beyond the West Bank. And where you see these darker area, uh, arrows, these are the areas where the aquifer is fed. Water falls in this way, drains down through the ground, fills the aquifer. And where you see, I mean, this is not an exact boundary, but this is now called the uh, confined area. You're not so much putting new water in there, but it's flowed down from the mountain and filled underwater areas that are, are confined areas of underground water. Okay, so you really have to understand boundaries. So why is this so important? Now this is an example of, let's just say, so here's the western basin and eastern basin. You can see the eastern and western aquifer. It's almost like you took a cross section through here through the mountain, so here's the mountain. This is where most of the water falls, and it fills, trickles down through the ground, fills the aquifer, runs down the mountain. And if this is the West Bank Division, Oslo II only pertains to the water that's in the West Bank. So what can Israel do here? Whatever they want, whatever they want and it's still connected. It's still so the same, so that Israel can do whatever they want here. Oslo II only pertains to water in the mountain aquifer uh, in the West Bank. So this is a map of where you see Israeli wells. Okay? So every circle here is an Israeli well. There's Right? So where does Israel put their wells? They take out of the aquifer outside of the West Bank, out of the same shared aquifer, and put as many wells as they want. Now, if you look even more closely, here is the segregation wall. Okay, winding its way right there. What's that? That's an Israeli well. Right, nice, close to an Israeli settlement. What's that? Okay. Israeli wells put in this area and even down here. So this map shows here in the blue, this is where you have the Israeli settlements. So you can see, you know, Israel has very conveniently placed their wells and doesn't really do much 
elsewhere. Okay, let's come back to the Oslo Accord then. So when they did set up the accord, remember only, over, only how you distribute water in the West Bank. This is the numbers that were agreed to by both sides in terms of who gets what, Israel or Palestine. And you can see it was divided into the northern, the western, and the eastern. And so out of this accord, agreed to by both sides, Israel was allocated, this is again million cubic meters per year, but just relative numbers, 103, Israel 42 for Palestine, 483 to 118, 40 to 54, Israel gets 80%, Palestine, Palestine 20%. And this is what was agreed to in that interim five year that was supposed to be only five years. So we still live under this, these numbers of how you distribute the water. Now, another layer of this. <clears throat> this is intensely bureaucratic, trying to decide who gets water, when, from where. And it's managed by what's called the Joint Water Committee, established at the time of the Oslo Accord. The Joint Water Committee has equal Israeli and Palestinian represent, representation. Equal numbers, Israel and Palestine. And to do anything, they have to arrive at a consensus. Meaning, if it's split 50-50, half, one way, that's not consensus, okay? So any well enhancement or anything you need to do with water in the West Bank has to be passed through the Joint Water Committee. It's a very complex, it's bureaucratic, it's time intensive, but essentially what it does is it gives Israel, and Palestine, but Israel's in the control position, it gives Israel veto power over any West Bank water development because it requires consensus and there's equal numbers. So if every Israeli represent, representative on the Joint Water Committee doesn't want a project to happen in Palestine, it cannot happen. Okay, now, another thing. Separate management of water networks. Israel, and what they want to do in the West Bank settlements, they can import, they can run pipes, because they can get all the water they want from out here, and then they can pipe it into their settlements, and that doesn't count. Because that's not dividing up West Bank water. So that's water they got out here and then they piped in. Okay, so they can import from their national water network and uh, you know as well as from West Bank wells, but Palestine lacks the access to get any kind of a really contiguous network, and and they can't import. But you know what they can do? They can buy it from Israel. Israel will sell it to them. Oh God! And they do. Okay. So, uh, so again, this maps, you know, you gotta kind of sit and stare at them and it helps not to be colorblind. Uh, but these are the Israeli water networks in the West Bank, okay? So you can see, just take a you know, look at the number of these Israeli networks that connect right to the edge of the West Bank. Why do they connect to the edge of the West Bank? Because then the pipes, they don't show the pipes connecting to all the water and the wells and this national water carry out there. So really the, is the, the settlements in West Bank, they have no problem. They just pipe it in. And the Palestinian networks you can see are not very well connected. There's no connections you know, for them to the Jordan River. There's really no connections for them outside of what they're allocated in the West Bank. Okay, a little bit more about the Oslo uh, Accord. So all the West Bank was divided up into area A, B, uh, or C. Area A, which was 18% of the West Bank, um, shown here, is that red? Thank you. Uh, 
really were areas surrounding some of the major, uh, major cities. And so these are full Palestinian control. Anything in area B, which is this gray area, is under Palestinian civil control, but Israeli security control, which means that the Israelis control from a security standpoint what can happen in there. So even if uh, Palestinian civil government decides to do something in these gray areas, Israelis can block it with their security forces, should they want. And then area C is full Israeli uh, control. Um, all this beige area. And if you're going to do anything there, it does require this Joint Water Commission um, and another commission, higher planning commission approval. But these are some of the most productive well zones, and they're under full Israeli control. So even there, Palestinians, by definition, lack control over a lot of these areas. So let's just take a look at the Joint Water Committee. This is public information. From 1995 to 2008, what is the record of the Joint Water Committee? So let's look at approval rates, Palestinians versus the Israelis. Um, uh, trying to get approved the placement of new wells. Every Israeli application was approved, and only 60% of Palestinians. And you go, well, why, why would the Palestinians agree, because they have veto power too, because they have equal, well, they just feel trapped. Because if they want to have any chance at getting a few, they feel like they have to agree to the Israelis. That's sort of the mentality there. Water supply networks, same you know, kind of disparity. Uh, wastewater, way more approval of Israeli than Palestinians. If you look at approval times, how long it sits there in the committee, um, water supply networks for Israeli requests are approved in 68 days for Palestinians in much, much longer time. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you have percentages, but numbers would also be important. Like if Palestinians were asking for three times as much as the yeah. Israelis, then actually they were getting the same amount. So right. Percentages are. That's a, that's, a, that's a very good point, and I don't have the actual numbers. You see what I mean? Yep, I certainly do. Yeah. So if you look at now this table of water that's available to the uh, Palestinians and look at what was available to them in 1995 at the time the accord was put in place. In fact, that's the numbers that were set in 1995 were based on what was currently being used. Um, total internal production to Palestinians, 118. They imported some from Israel back then. So their total supply was this number, 140, close to 146 population. So their per capita supply, water supply, was about 105. If you look at in 2010, they actually are producing less internally. That's actually gone down. In part, that means that they have to buy or import more from Israel. So that's happening now. So the total supply has gone up a little bit, but the population has gone up uh, enough more. So the actual water supply to Palestinians is less now than it was in 1995. So it's not unusual to find graphics put together like this by groups trying to help you visualize what's going on. So in this graphic, it compares uh, rainfall in London to basically this area we've been talking about. Just to say, all right, you know, you tend to hear how wet London is. So this is a place that receives significant amount of rain. But if we just focus in on this portion that looks at how it's distributed. So here's the West Bank mountain aquifer that Israel takes 80% and Palestinians get 20%. So here's the initial uh, appropriation, 80 uh, to 20. And what we're leading to is eventually what's available 
in the households for Palestinians versus uh, the Israelis, including the, the settlers. About 70 liters per day per Palestinian versus, this number varies actually, but this graphic has about 300 liters per day uh, per Israeli. And the World Health Organization recommends 100 liters per day per person, sort of as a minimum to get by with your basic needs for water, for drinking and hygiene and, and basic household uh, function. Uh, approved. You know, this is really contested. The Israeli military will demolish wells that they claim are uh, not approved. And so there's a you know, constant, is this well legit or not? And the Israeli military will uh, demolish some wells. So anyway, you can see the kind of disparity that exists between uh, Palestinians and Israelis. So again, this is the kind of things you can see trying to make this point, uh, you know, settlers in Israel bathing while Palestinians try to collect just a little bit of water, same kind of point made here. The big pipelines, the Israeli pipelines, just trying to get a little bit of water. So people are trying to make the point. Okay, I want to come back and talk a little bit more about this national uh, water carrier. Major engineering project, completed in 1964, it was built by the Israeli National Water Company um, called Mekarot, and it's, uh, they said it's about 100 miles of pipes and tunnels and canals. Um, so they take quite a bit, you know, 380 million cubic meters per year is pumped out uh, to Israel none for the West Bank, none for Gaza. And as a result of that, that lowered the Sea of Galilee by uh, about two meters. And so if you took an aerial view, it's, you can see snaking through the Israeli countryside, this is the national water carrier, either in a large canal or sometimes it's going through a tunnel, major engineering uh, project to carry the water down to southern Israel. Now, uh, they're still working on this, and I'm going to see if I can run a little something to show you. They want to add even more that's going to be from uh, desalination plants. These are big, large, massive plants that takes uh, seawater, salt water, and take the salt out. And uh, they want to add that to this system of networks. So let me just see if this will run for me, you'll see. So that's the national water carrier. There's the Sea of Galilee. You don't need the music so much. And you can see, by pumping out, you'll see the, the Sea of Galilee shrink down, okay? Now what they want to do, or they're doing, is they're adding desalination plants on the coast so they can pipe in and join the network. So they've been investing a lot of money in these desal plants. Well, it takes a lot of power. The most innovative ones are trying to use solar power for them, but they're power intensive. So by adding into this, now what they're gonna do is they wanna add another pipe that delivers water up the mountains. And there's a new water supply to Jerusalem. And, it, and their hope is that now they can start to actually add so much from this, they can reverse a little bit of this and hopefully refill the Sea of Galilee. Okay? Uh, the, wonderful engineering plants, you know? So uh, Israelis are hoping that 
at some point, 75% of their drinking water will be desail water. It's all going to be Israel. None of it's going to go to Gaza or uh, the West Bank. But, you know, Israel is progressing. Um, make sure I get back here. All right. So here's the water carrier. This is, remember, this is rainfall somewhat here. This is all desert down there. I think this is a fascinating satellite photo. What do you notice about where it's green? Okay, this is desert down here. Look at the demarcation of green as you get down to this border of the West Bank and that border of Gaza. So Israelis have done a wonderful job of setting up water systems to irrigate their land. Okay, now, here's where I'm going to step back and um, if you're like me and you get to this point, you're all, we got to do something about this. You know, Israel, they're water hogs and they can't do this, right? So I want to put this a little bit in context of Israel relative to us. Okay. So this annual water consumption per capita in different countries. So here's where we are. Okay. There's Israel. Okay, now Israel, we say, oh, so that's not fair because Palestinians will be down here someplace. But let's just, you know, be a little bit cautious as we say, because Israelis are really quite progressive relative to us in managing water. Okay, I'll show a few other graphics here. Daily, average daily domestic use. Here's U.S. and Israel. So we're about three times as much, consume about three times as much water as the typical Israeli. Okay. So this is, you know, maybe a little summary of consumption in Israel versus what the World Health recommends, 100. Palestinians who are, happen to be connected to some grid, Palestinians who are not connected, have even less water. And the Gaza situation is particularly dire because, as I said, they have very erratic water supply and heavily polluted underneath their land. So it's hard to team tell when you say how much do they utilize. Well, how much of what they utilize is actually safe. Um, and we're nearing the end here, so I like to you know, just do this little visualization of uh, American water consumption. This is a, a nice little website, worldmapper.org, where they do things like this. This is you know, the way we typically see maps, you know, based on land area. So what they do with this worldmapper.org is they resize the map according to various parameters. So just to get you thinking about how this works, what would the map look like if now countries are sized according to their population? So what countries in the map are going to get really big? India, India China, and what's going to get small? Canada, Canada Australia. Okay. You see how that works? Okay. So, you know, there's Australia, there's Canada, there's India. Okay. Now, what's the map going to look like if countries are sized according to the proportion of worldwide water use that they... Okay. And now you see how sub-Saharan Africa is in such a, you know, difficult situation. So anyway, you know, anytime we do think about the Israeli-Palestinian issue, we also need to think about our own situation and how much water we as Americans uh, utilize. Okay, then just finally a little bit about innovations and opportunities. I mentioned the, uh, the National Water Carrier as an example of uh, Israeli innovation. These are it's a modern desalination plant and, you know, a lot of progress, a lot of good new technology in that uh, area. So, you know, you can put major desal plants along the ocean. Um, and so it's not unusual to see tight articles like this, you know, in Israel. Water where there was none because Israel's been very good at engineering. Is this the Oscar?
full coup agreement where uh, it was agreed that Israel was going to get 80% of the water and Palestinians get 20%. Did the Palestinians actually agree to this? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Who was well, ultimately, Arafat was the one that signed, uh, that did the agreement. Um, you know, and you got to at least remember that in, in his mind, this was a five-year interim agreement that um, it it didn't look that unreasonable at the time because it basically used numbers for what the Palestinians at that time were being allocated. And so to have a peace agreement, I'm just putting myself in the mind of, of them, to have a peace agreement that at least kept our water where it was amongst all the other things that were in Oslo seemed at the time to be okay. If you imagine that this was five years and then we're going to really figure out how we're going to have a permanent agreement to solve the water issue. That's, that's one of the things that people look back and say, it looks like the Palestinians... Uh, were a little weak at that time. Yeah, this, this organization, Friends of the Earth Middle East, is working very diligently in trying to promote, um, through their local connections, communities talking to each other, and developing community leaders. Um, and, and I don't know this for sure, but my guess is they're not 100% successful. Every area they go to try to get two communities to work together, but where they find people on the ground that kind of see the issue and aren't so tied up in national politics and they can get them to work together. Yeah, very yeah that's the kind of thing that I think can make a difference. Uh, could you comment a little bit more about, uh, I forget which, it was towards the end, you showed that the water quality in Gaza water source and the mm -hmm. quest, there's questions about the water quality. Right. Could you uh, comment a little bit more? I, I'm wondering if <coughs> the, the citizens of Gaza, are, do they have, because of scarcity, are they using questionable Yes, they water? are. The answer to that is yes, oh, they no. Yeah, yes, they are. And so public health issues related to their poor quality water uh, are rising. And, uh, you know, this is a cycle that builds on itself every time you go through one of these cycles of uh, Israeli bombing and so forth and you destroy more Gaza infrastructure, it just becomes more dire. But um, yeah, the, uh, the water underneath Gaza is pretty heavily polluted. Um, and as aquifers, are, as aquifers are drained that are close to the coast where there's seawater. You know, water is just a gravity thing. So if you drain a water supply underneath this fresh water and it's sitting next to seawater, and now you create the gravity for seawater to run down into that, now you're, you're not only adding pollution, but you're adding seawater to your aquifer and it just becomes uh, really unfit for human consumption without extensive treatment. Well, then, if you don't have the money to treat the water, what do you do? You don't have money to buy water, so, and you don't have money to be, build a desail plant. I mean, Gaza sits right on the, they could, Mediterranean, they could build it, but they don't have the, the resources, so all the desail plants are Israeli. So, if I understand you correctly, this is, these are, this is already resulting in some public health mm -hmm. concerns, and this is public health disaster in waking? Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. When you get contaminated water, that will be problems. Dave, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks really for coming. Thank you.